Thanks for checking out this movie review video. This is for the 1983 Italian giallo film, A Blade in the Dark, and I enjoyed this film. Uh, just so you know, I'm big into giallo. If you haven't been watching more of my reviews, and if you are also into giallo, I actually have a playlist on my channel for just giallo film reviews. So I've been putting a lot in there. I don't even know what number I'm at at the moment, but it's been throwing them in there, and I've been having fun with it. Uh, available on Shutter, most of them when I'm doing the reviews, but not all of them. So, uh, Blade in the Dark, directed by Lamberto Baba. Yes, he is the son of Mario Baba, who I also have reviews for on my channel and an entire playlist of Mario Baba film reviews. I like my old Italian horror. Uh, Baba's done other films such as Demons, Demons 2, Demons 3, The Ogre, Macabre, You'll Die at Midnight. Delirium and the Mask of Satan, although that's not all of them. Uh, the script for this film was written by Dardano Sicchetti. As one of the people, he's done other scripts, big scripts, such as The Cat of Nine Tales, Shock, Cannibals in the Streets, City of the Living Dead, The Beyond, The House by the Cemetery, The New York Ripper, The Scorpion with Two Tails, Demons, Demons 2, Demons 3, The Ogre, Killer Crocodile, Killer Crocodile 2, and A Bay of Blood, just to name some. He has a lot of credits. And he wrote this script with his wife, Elisa Briganti, who's also written scripts for Zombie, yes, the Lucio Fulci Zombie, Manhattan Baby, 1990, The Bronx Warriors, and The Exterminators of the Year 3000, which sounds interesting. Uh, just so people know, right up front, the titular killer in this film Tony, who goes by Linda at some point, and we'll kind of, I'll dive into that whole situation probably at the end of the review, um, is played by Michel Suave, who is well known for uh, directing the film Stage Fright. He also has had some small roles in other films throughout his career, such as um, he had a very small, very small cameo in The New York Ripper by Fulci, also Fulci's uh, City of the Living Dead and Baba's um, demons. But he has a much larger role in this, obviously, as the killer. This film was also titled House of Dark Stairs. So, mm, I don't know if... I think I might like that one a little bit more because it, it has more meaning to the actual storyline with the film. No sets were actually built for this film as the whole script was written to take place in the Italian villa where it was filmed, as you will, you know, recognize it's all in one place where this is filmed. I like films like that. Uh, part of the reason being, I think it kind of creates more of an air of the characters being kind of locked in, stuck in this area with the killer or whatever evil it ends up being. So I like that aspect of it. It kind of ratchets the tension up that way. But also, I think especially with a film like this where there's kind of an adventurous nature where characters are going around the place, you get more of a sense of the actual layout. You feel familiar with how everything is laid out with the house, at least in this film. And I, I just like having that knowledge when I'm watching a film. Uh, and actually, this house belonged to producer Luciano Martino, just so you know. And he's been involved with a bunch of other giallo and just in general Italian horror films in the past. Um, as a producer, but he's also done some writing. Uh, I don't think he's done any directing, but definitely writing. Argento's Tenebre, one of my favorite giallo films, was actually an influence for Bava for this film uh, because he acted as an assistant for Argento during the filming of Tenebre. And I guess you, you can kind of see some of the influence there, one of the main influences being the brutality at times with it and the real violence in some of the kills in particular, um, I my favorite kill I'll talk about in a little bit. This is probably a lot of people's favorite kill, honestly. It was initially shot for TV in a four-hour block. Or no, I'm sorry, a two-hour block that was supposed to be four episodes. That's what it was supposed to be. But they said it was too violent and too gory, so they ended up editing it down from the two-hour block to release it as an actual feature film. Uh, Would have been interesting to see what was cut out of it and what constituted that full two hours the version that i watched on shutter was like an hour 48 so they only really cut out like 12 minutes but 12 minutes can actually add a lot to a film so this film has a nice start with the bloody ball coming out of the basement after the kid goes down and screams 
Note that there was a heartbeat sound when the kid was going down the stairs. Now, we realize that we don't initially, when we're watching the film, we don't realize that that is a film within a film, which is a very meta thing. And there are a bunch of meta things in this film that Cicchetti and uh, Briganti wrote in, which I think is kind of cool about, it's a horror film about people make, well, it's a horror film, giallo film, about people making a horror film, basically. And it's cool. And there's some other meta stuff that I'll talk about. But uh, initially you think these are the events of how we're setting things up. This is what we're doing. And it's a good attention grabber to start that way with the little kids. It looks creepy. It looks scary going down the stairs. Like I said, note there was like a heartbeat sound of the kid, you know, being scared as he was going down. And then the bloody, there's a scream. Then the bloody ball comes up and hits the wall and leaves that blood there. Very cool. I like that. Then later we realize, oh, they're just working on a movie. But we do realize that there is a significance between what happens in real life in the in real life in this film and what was happening in the film itself. That it was a story taken from the killer by Sandra, I believe her name is, and put to film. So yeah, and which is why uh, Linda ends up going to destroy the film. Uh, the close-up of the exacto knife cutting the picture of a nude woman shows an underlying hatred for the female form and female in general, which obviously at the end we end up under understanding, I mean understanding within the context of the film that is, I say, uh, that Tony was that kid who was told, who was, you know, poked fun at and told that he was a wuss, that he was a female, uh, to go down the stairs Otherwise, he was too scared and he was a female, and that was some sort of childhood trauma. I'll talk more about that later, how that is currently a problematic thing, but we also need to keep in mind when this was done. But once again, I will revisit that later. So yeah. Um, but the cutting with the X-Acto knife of the picture of the female form sets it up to say there is some sort of hatred for women for one reason or another, which we end up finding out, as Bruno describes in the end of the film, that it was... Tony trying to get rid of the female portion of himself and he was just externalizing that when he was in the mindset of Linda and going and killing other women, you know, as like an external outlet for trying to kill the inner female himself. I like how Bruno isn't at all suspicious of, or concerned that the character of Katya was lurking in the house that he's staying in. And why was she in a closet? And why was her diary left behind? Because the diary was in the closet with her. So no, there's a lot of stuff that doesn't really make sense per se in this film. Uh, like I said, the first thing being, why is uh, he not just shocked by this random person having broken into the house that he's living in now, that he's renting? Uh, then she was in a closet, like she was hanging out in a closet, literally. That would indicate that she's hiding from him, maybe up to something nefarious. And then she also left her diary behind, which is weird. But uh, he's just like immediately so friendly to her. And it's such a weird thing. I just don't get it. Uh, very unnatural. And there's, you know, another one of the things that isn't perfect about this film. Katya's death behind the wiring looks stupid. I hate this death scene. I think it's really dumb. There were a few of the shots that looked good, but the fact that initially, and they show it for so long, the knife is, the killer's trying to get the knife through the wiring and it won't go. And then all of a sudden, after trying for so long, it just goes, which doesn't make any sense. So either they were holding it back for like torturing purposes or it just makes no sense because the shape of it didn't change over time and the wiring didn't look different. It was all the same size. So I think that whole scene's drawn out and it's stupid. It's not a good scene in my opinion, but the exacto knife, that knife, the retractable knife is a cool weapon. I like it. I specifically like when they do the close ups of it and you hear the noise of it clicking up. Uh, it's just the indicator of here we go. Someone's going to get killed. I like that Bruno picks up a whispering conversation on his recording equipment and then he's able to hear it by enhancing it and writing it down. That kind of starts the uh, investigation, so to speak. And in general, that's one of the things I love about this film 
is the investigative nature of Bruno trying to figure all this out himself as he kind of sneaks around the house. Well, not really sneaks, walks around the house, investigates, tries to figure out what's going on, taking everything in. And I feel like the way the writing in a script was, it's really good pacing at what intervals we get little tidbits of the backstory. Um, but also like these revelations as Bruno's finding them of, you know, here's some evidence, something weird's going on here. Uh, the pacing of that's very, very good. And I think for that reason, the film feels like it really moves and doesn't really drag much at all. So, and it, it being like an hour and 48 minutes, that's a pretty big triumph in my opinion. I like the exploratory nature of how the film moves throughout the house and the grounds of the, of the house as well. Uh, once again, like I was saying, I like kind of getting a feel for the actual layout of it. When the caretaker says the owner only rents to short-term tenants... My suspicion immediately went to Tony being the killer. And so I very early on guessed who would end up being the killer. I never deviated from that, honestly, because that bit of dialogue is very odd. And it would only be there for a specific reason, because things that are scripted are there for a reason. And so when the caretaker says he only rents short term, I was like, there is no reason to rent short term like this other than you want to be able to kill those people and be like, oh, well, everyone's short-term, so there's a lot of turnover, so people just come and go. So, just saying. They basically tell you the caretaker is not the killer when Julia talks about horror movie cliches and says, quote, and obviously it's the caretaker. Just another one of those things about being very meta, this film. They talk about kind of horror movie tropes a little bit, Julia in particular, in that moment uh she, also she makes a um a comment about the play that she was working on and the the uh main theme of it ends up being kind of the main theme of how you get to the killer in this movie so yet another one of those meta moments so there are a lot of kind of clues littered out throughout the film but they're presented in ways that people wouldn't necessarily take them seriously as being a hint but on a second viewing, you probably would catch them. So many comments are made about a bad smell at the pool with this, which really made me believe very early on that the bodies are around the pool. That ends up being the case with that. I don't know what that was. It was like some giant metal vat, but that was near the pool. It was like in the pool house, I guess, um, that the caretaker ends up finding and then he gets killed. Uh, with the wrench, bludgeoned to death with that wrench, which is a terrible, another terrible kill scene. The way it was shot and acted, it looked really bad. Like, it was corny and crappy. That one sucked. So, obviously, this is not a, f a perfect film. The shot of the killer's hand stroking the knives and the noises they make sounds like the killing is a little bit sexual. Now, that ends up not being the case, but at that time, I was like, man, it sounds like they're like getting off just like running their finger over these knives. And that's an important part, too, because that's the first time that you see a hand with nail polish on it. And it's red nail polish, which they try to throw you a red herring with, no pun intended on that, with Julia, because later on, Julia in the bathroom, when she's talking to Bruno, is putting on red nail polish. So they're trying to kind of throw you for a loop there. But when they're initially showing the hand with the red nail polish, like touching those knives, that's the first time you get any sort of misdirection that it is actually a female. So, but to me, when I saw that, I thought, the only reason they would actually be showing this is because they want you to think that it's a female. Because otherwise, with pretty much every other giallo, they're wearing gloves because they don't want you to know it is, a, is it a feminine hand or is it a masculine hand. So just saying. This is how I view the films. Because I've watched a lot of giallo, so this is how I view them when I watch them. Angela's death is pretty messed up and violent. Now, this was my favorite death. I thought it was really well done because it's so messed up it's so violent it's gory it's really well done that was the one where she gets her hand stabbed through and then like she pulls her hand through it which seems painful then she gets the bag over her head and is suffocated and then after she's well actually while she's suffocating she's getting her head slammed into the counter and then after she's dead from that her head is hung over the bathtub and her throat slit and all this blood comes out. And then she gets turned over and you just see 
the slit throat and it's intense and that was a very well done kill scene in my opinion and it, that in particular i think was very inspired by tenebre with how bloody tenebre really is honestly so the pace at which bruno discovers things in the film is done really well not much downtime already talked about that childhood trauma turning a person into a monster this is used a good deal in horror so there's actually a quote of childhood trauma turning a person into a monster i believe that's something that sandra ends up talking about in context of the movie that she was making and that was mined pretty well i think in ho older horror films now it shows up in a pro you know now at times problematic way in this film but i'll you know still i'll talk about that a little bit more the strong focus on the segment of film made uh, made me believe it was steeped in real events, and the focus on the chance of female made me believe it had a strong role. Now, the fact that they focused, they really did focus a lot on the kids chanting over and over, female, 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 so you put that together with them, you know, intentionally showing the hand with the nail polish on it, and then also um, the childhood trauma thing being talked about, all, the, all those clues just kind of coming together to build the case that it is in fact tony and and the uh renting thing and also the fact that there is a moment where tony just randomly shows up and he doesn't really have a reason to be there if you do a rewatch you know p take take note of that although i i think that it's probably written off most commonly as well he owns the place so he can kind of show up whenever so they work julia pretty hard as a focus for a killer they really create a lot of suspicion around here. The jealousy that she has, which is pretty intense because of other women being around Bruno, randomly just showing up at times, which we then find out later she's lying about the fact that she was involved in this play. That seems suspect. The red nail polish, which I talked about, and the fact that she says they met playing tennis, and there's that connection with Linda having all those tennis balls per Sandra, because Sandra knew Linda. So they would they do work her pretty hard. They really want the audience to be like, oh my gosh, it's Julia. It's got to be Julia. No, can't fool people who know Giallo. It's a solid reveal when Sandra calls Linda and they show that she answers the phone at the property. When they show in the background that you see the house. I think that was kind of like the, the pool house or I think maybe there was like a guest house there basically. Um, that That is a cool reveal. I, ex you know, I expected that she would still be there, but... Um, for some people who aren't following it necessarily as closely, that's a cool reveal. The care, oh yeah, it, this does bear repeating though. The caretaker being beaten to death with the wrench was a terrible scene. It looked awful. How did all the tennis balls fall from the ceiling? In the end, when Linda is going after Julia, all those tennis balls just fall on Julia from the ceiling. How did that happen? Like, how was that set up? It doesn't make any sense. It's such a random thing. I, did, I thought it was dumb. Bruno was so close to being able to save Julia in that. He was very, like, literally he was seconds, like maybe 10 seconds away or so from being able to, to catch Julia. Now, I will say that scene where she find, where she's being chased through the hall by Linda is well done, not just for the standpoint of it's intense and how fast it moves and then she gets stabbed and it looks good because of that, but also because they do a good job of showing enough of Linda, but not showing too much of Linda that you know at that point it's not a female necessarily. So, well done. A very lame finish to the film, though, <laughs> with with uh, Linda accidentally stabbing herself. I just, it, it looked dumb. It's a dumb way to end it. There should have been something way better. I mean, just have Bruno kill her. Just have Bruno kill Tony slash Linda. Just, just do it that way. It would have been much better. So I don't like the ending. But there's a lot of stuff I do like about it, as you've heard me say. Like his father, uh, Lamberto Baba has a good use of shadows. Uh, he does a lot of cool stuff with shadows in this. Not, not necessarily for any real purpose, but sometimes just for it looks cool visually. So take note of that when you if you rewatch the film. Also, he another thing he picked up from his father, which he did once in the film, which I thought looked really good, but Bob, but Mario Bava used to do it a lot, was um, the rotation around in like a circular circular or semicircular motion around one character. Now, B Lamberto Bava does it in this film 
the part where one of the parts where Bruno's sitting in his, like his setup of all his recording equipment and it goes from like the left I think like his left side and goes all the way around like behind him. It looks cool. It was a cool rotation. You have to understand the time this film was made. Okay? Lots of films correlated anyone other than heterosexual as being abnormal and therefore being unhinged and capable of murder. Now, if this film was made nowadays, I would look at this and say, yeah, that's not good. You should definitely not make the film that way. Now, that said, when I watch films that are older, I always watch them with the mindset of the time period they came out. And how did people try, you know, try to think? How did people think back then? What was deemed as acceptable? What was deemed as not acceptable? Because then you can understand what the film's trying to go for and just also the context for which the audience was receiving it. Um, another thing is I know a lot of people will see a film like this and say, well, you know, we shouldn't promote this film nowadays because it has these problematic themes in it, like saying that people who aren't heterosexual are mentally unhinged. And yes, that is problematic, but as long as people understand that that's how it was viewed, and that's not how we do things now, that's the important thing. I'm not a proponent of erasing history in this way, because it's good to be, re to be reminded of what it was to be able to look now and see how far we've come, especially with, with an instance of this. Like I said, this is kind of a thing that was used quite a bit in film, and I'm glad that we've gotten away from that now. And it, not even that long ago, it was still kind of used. I mean, I think it was in the 90s, the film Cherry Falls with Jay Moore in it and uh, Brittany Murphy. That did something very similar. So just keep that in mind. So I'm all for keeping these things so we are reminded. Aspects of this remind me of Black Christmas. I don't know if anyone saw this coming or if anyone saw it in the film like I did. The single location, which I love that about Black Christmas. I love it about this one the whispering and the weird sounds that the killer makes there are if you really pay attention linda makes a lot of weird noises in this that really reminded me of the weird noises that are being made by the killer in black christmas which i think is good it ups the creep fa factor quite a bit and then the suffocation scene with angela there you go which there's another very good suffocation scene in black christmas obviously so yeah um, yeah, and that's all I have to say. I really did enjoy A Blade in the Dark. I think it was very fun. Obviously, I point out there are problems with it, but I thought it was really fun. I mean, out of five stars with half stars in play, I'm going to give it four stars. I was kind of between three and a half and four, but how much I enjoy it, it's just fun. The other thing is the directing and the cinematography is really good. It's very smooth. And that pacing, that pacing is a big thing, especially with older films like this. A lot of them had not that great pacing. Pacing is great in this one. So four stars for me. Uh, let's get nerdy. Let's talk about this one. Uh, if you want to talk about this, but other Giallo as well, we can do that as well. Let's get nerdy. Now, do me a quick favor, though. Hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. That is your best way to repay me. If you like any video I've ever done, this one included, because I don't make money doing this. I'm just spending my time putting this out there so I can connect with cool, nerdy horror people like you probably are watching this. So let's talk, let's get nerdy. And then do me that favor, hit that subscribe, but also hit the notification bell because then you'll know when I'm putting up new videos. And if people watch it as soon as it comes out or close to as soon as it comes out, it does help the YouTube algorithm to get me more views and help us grow, grow this channel. But anyway, regardless, I do appreciate you taking the time to check this out. And until next time, keep it brutal.